Now in our eleventh section, we finally arrived at the awesome subject of reckoning. It seems awesome to many, but there's a, a simple reason for that. And the reason we've waited this long to touch, really to touch upon the doctrine truth of reckoning is because reckoning can only be carried out on the basis of truth. The facts must first be seen before one can effectively reckon. Many who come into contact with this truth feel that reckoning means that if we count upon a thing hard enough and reckon it, enough that it'll come about a sort of uh, positive thinking type of uh, thing no if there's any effort to reckoning then it's not true reckoning because reckoning the word means to count upon a thing, count it so. Reckoning has to have facts upon which to count. And once the believer sees and understands the facts, the truth, reckoning comes effortlessly and naturally. Reckoning becomes his attitude. Well, Lord, I see that. And uh, I simply count upon it. I simply see that it's true. I reckon it is. So I, I reckon it. So I, I know it is. That is reckoning. And this cannot be carried out if the facts are not known. The truth is not known. So one doesn't arrive at into the identification truths, so to speak, by reckoning. But when one sees the truth and begins to rest in them, reckoning is a natural result, an effortless result, a normal result. He simply, the Christian, will simply reckon so. Reckoning is not the starting point. Knowing is the starting point. Reckoning is a result of knowing. And that's why in our series we have covered a lot of ground, we've covered a lot of truth. We've sought to move amongst the different truths that are revealed in the Word as pertaining to Christian growth so that we might have some truth to fasten our faith upon, so to speak, to rest our weight upon, to abide in, to reckon upon. Knowing is to precede reckoning. Reckoning must be uh, based upon divinely revealed and received fact. And other, otherwise, faith has no foundation upon which to rest. And when we truly know the facts, we will reckon uh, spontaneously. So that that is a good uh, key to remember that if reckoning is has any effort to it, it's not true reckoning, and the reason that it has effort to it is because one is not sure of his facts. One may one may see the facts to a degree. One may uh, acquiesce to them and affirm the facts. But if the heart has not truly been prepared, not only through study but through the things that the Holy Spirit takes one through, through the things that the Holy Spirit takes one, if that preparation has not been carried out by the Spirit, the Christian will not be ready to reckon. We're at the mercy of God, dear friends. Does that sound ominous or does that sound blessed? a father of mercies. And it's his aim, it's his goal to bring the Christian to the place where he can reckon so that he will be freed from the 
progressively freed from the dominion of all the things that hold him down, that ruin his Christian life and uh, block his growth and render his service ineffective. So that God is working to bring the Christian into what God has already done on his behalf in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that we needn't be at all concerned because of the fact that as we're brought into these deeper truths, we're brought in on the basis of grace and on the basis of sheer mercy, and not because we deserve it or earned it or we're able to arrive. No, sheer mercy. And at the same time, it is God's explicit will for us so that we be, we can be sure that he will bring us in as we look to him. And I think that in order to become more sure of the explicit truths that have to do with reckoning, there, of course, we have to move into Romans 6. And if we turn to Romans 6, we can share some time together in these few verses here that have explicitly to do with reckoning. They reveal the truths upon which we are to reckon. And if we start up above a little in uh, Romans 5.20, it would be a good place to begin. Moreover, the law entered, the law was brought in, that the offense, that sin might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that was the explicit ministry of the law, was to show man that he was a lost sinner, and that his sin and the offense might abound, that he, there might be no question in the man's heart that he's a lost sinner. And when, this, when the law had done its work of death, bringing the man to the end of himself, so to speak, showing to him that he was dead in sins, dead to God. Then, in looking off to the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of Calvary, he saw that grace much more abounded, that there was enough grace because of the Lord Jesus, grace and truth in the Lord Jesus and the work of Calvary, that there was enough of it to overcome the penalty of the law, death, and that the man received uh, grace, uh, received life through grace. He received death, uh, saw his death through law, and he received and saw his, his life through grace. But where sin abounded, and it had to abound to drive the man into the realm of grace, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Praise the Lord for that. And then we move over to Romans 6, 1. And Paul mentions here that... Uh, just because sin abounded and caused the Christian to enter into grace uh, doesn't mean that the person should continue in sin so that he will be able to experience more grace. And Paul brings out in the next few verses why this is unthinkable. In Romans 6, 2, he shows that it's impossible. It's just out of, out of reason. Because, he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he's using this as a platform to reveal the fact that uh, the Christian is, has died in the Lord Jesus out of the realm of sin, away from the domination and dominion of sin, freed from the power of sin. Not the presence of sin, but the power, the slavery of sin. The Christian will always be in the presence of sin as long as he's living in his as yet unredeemed body, as long as he's in this world. He cannot get away from the presence of sin, but he can be freed from the, the domination and the slavery of sin. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And you notice he says here, are dead. And the revised is clearer yet, how shall we who died to sin? And Paul's very careful to show the Christian that it is not a matter of dying to sin here and now to get off Mother's dominion. But it is a matter of seeing 
a finished work at Calvary. Who died to sin? I have been crucified with, together with Christ. Are dead to sin. And it is the aorist tense, the finished work tense. Completed. All done. How shall we that are, are dead to sin live any longer therein? Who died to sin? And we're not called to die to sin. We're called to believe that we did die to sin. Positionally, in God's sight. And it's to be in our sight, too. In verse um, verse 3 of Romans 6, baptized into his death. In verse 4, buried with him. Well, when did he? When was he buried? 2,000 years ago. And that's where God identified us with him. In his economy, in his sight, God placed us in the Lord Jesus. Buried with him. And in verse 5, united or planted with him. Verse 6, our old man was crucified with him. And verse 7, he that hath died with Christ. Verse 8, if we died with him. And verse 11, reckon yourselves dead unto sin. Not dying unto sin. Dead unto sin. And verse 13, yield or present yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And uh, there's another thought here too that's extremely important. And in fact is that the Christian is not dead but that he died. And the Christian is alive. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And the Christian is alive in Christ. But he died, and then he was recreated in Christ, and he was born again. And he was brought up out of death, and now the Christian is living forever. He's already passed through death. So we're not to count ourselves dead, period. We're to count ourselves, as far as sin and the world and Satan and self are concerned, we're to count ourselves dead unto them. Death now separates us from them, but the Christian is now alive, alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand and look back, and we look across the tomb, we look across the grave, we look across the realm of death that we pass through. And on the other side of that realm, is self and uh, sin and Satan and the world and we're, we're cut off from that by death as we count it so progressively freed as we grow and if we if our attitude if we cease to count that so and we begin to rely upon ourselves we, we, we begin to uh, look to the world and all then it's, it's always step back across that tomb, that death, and we're back in the old realm. And that's why self can spring up instantly. Self is not dead, period. Self is held in the place of death as we count upon the facts. The Holy Spirit ministers that finished work of death and applies it to the old life as we count it so, because we're to live by faith. So as we become careless or self-confident and so forth, and we cease reckoning and our attitude is, well, I'll, I'll take care of this, I'll do this, back we go across into the old self realm and we get the benefit of that. Self is uh, once more upon the throne and we become carnal, self-centered Christians. So it's a walk and it's an attitude based upon the truth. That's reckoning. And that's why at one moment you can be victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ the next moment uh, self can be reigning and uh, that's why you hear of certain things happening amongst Christians for instance uh, they wonder how it could ever happen it's simply because they step back across into the old realm and that's why Paul is giving these truths so explicitly to show us where we stand Verse uh, 3, Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And of course this is a baptism of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit as we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 where all believers were baptized into the body of Christ. That we were immersed, we were dipped in, we were placed in the Lord Jesus. We were born into him. Of God are ye in Christ Jesus. And the baptism, it means to be placed in, to be dipped in, to be immersed. 
and the Holy Spirit placed us in Christ. We were baptized into the body of Christ. We became members of his body. And likewise, since we were in Christ, and he placed us in Christ at Calvary, we were identified with him there. We were baptized, uh, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We were baptized, uh, since we were in him, we, uh, his death became our death. We were included in that death died unto sin in Christ. And we think of this uh, in Galatians 3.27, For as many of you ha as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And as the Holy Spirit placed us in Christ, Christ became our life. We were hidden in Him. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we put on Christ. We put on a new man. And when Paul tells us to put on a new man, it means simply to take our position in our thinking, in our attitude, that I'm in Christ. I'm, I'm, so to speak, putting on the new life. I'm taking my position in my faith and my attitude. Put on the new man. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And of course that is what water baptism pictures, depicts the spiritual fact, truth. Water baptism is where the Christian is confessing to all that he has been crucified and has died in Christ and buried and he's risen again in the Lord Jesus. And as he is taken down into the water, the picture of burial, he's taken under the water and he's brought up out of the water on resurrection ground, newness of life. And he's showing the world in this uh, picture that he's now in the Lord Jesus Christ risen and he, his heart, he, he intends to walk in Christ, walk in the Spirit, walk as a Christian as he abides in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that water baptism doesn't do anything, it simply pictures what has already been done. And it's the Christian acquiescing to this before others at the testimony. And how many Christians uh, have been baptized? Many who uh, and had no idea what was going on, except, well, I had to be baptized so that I could be become a member of this church, for instance. And the sad, sad part is that uh, many, many uh, of our churches, sound churches, for instance, will there will be the same old gospel message, even on the Lord's Day and morning. Uh, the gospel message given. Here are two or three, four hundred Christians sitting there, and here is another gospel message given to them, and any sinners who might be there. And then, of course, the invitation is given, and uh, one or two maybe will come forward and be saved. And what happens that evening? why so often we're going to have a baptismal service so these new converts can join the church. And they were made a decision at uh, 11.58 in the morning, and that evening at 7.35, they go down into the water. How much does that dear Christian, new babe in Christ, know what's going on? How does he know what's, uh, what his baptism means? He loses out much in the blessing and... Uh, the testimony and stand that his baptism is to mean. So baptism is a very water baptism is a very important thing, but it's simply and still and ever shall be a picture, a testimony, simply a testimony, to what uh, to the wonderful truth that is already established, that has already happened to the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ back at Calvary identification and then in uh, Romans 6 4 therefore we were buried with him uh, by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life and that's uh, That ties in very closely with Romans 6.13, that we are to present ourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, to walk in newness of life, 
a life that is on resurrection ground, a life that has uh, sprung out of death. Buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, because we were identified with the Lord Jesus, and we were brought up out of death also, brought up new creations in Christ Jesus, so that we can walk in newness of life, not in the oldness of a letter, not in self-effort, not as unsaved people, but as those who are born again in the Lord Jesus, and we begin to grow in him. And that uh, where the Lord Jesus is more and more fully seen in our lives and as our life. For to me to live is Christ, Christ who is our life. And then in uh, Romans 6, 5. For if we have been, and actually he's saying there since, since there's no question there, it's since we have been, since we have been planted or united together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And you think right away of Ephesians 2, 6, where God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's our position. That's the source of our life. We're, we're hid with Christ in God. And a Christian should realize that the, 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 the living Lord Jesus is his life. And the source of our life is in glory. We were thinking back a little further where uh, we have already died in Christ. The Christian has died in Christ. Who died to sin? And uh, the Christian does not have to go through death again. The Christian has already died once in Christ. And there's no death for the Christian. The Christian is, is alive eternally. And when the Christian uh, closes his eyes in what we call death, he doesn't—he doesn't die at all. The instant, uh, the instant he quits this world, he's alive. He's alive, uh, fully alive in glory. And there's no gap. There's no dark river to cross. There's, there's not even a, a lightning flash uh, gap there. He's instantly, he just keeps on living, but now he's really alive in glory. And he doesn't experience death at all, actually. Death, uh, death, what we call death here in this world is not death for the Christian. He's just changing environment. He's uh, closed his eyes and passed out of this world, but he's instantly uh, alive in the new world because he's all, always been alive in, in the world, uh, in the new world ever since he's been in the Lord Jesus Christ, alive in Christ. Life is hid with Christ in God right now. He doesn't have to wait till what we call death to, to arrive there. He's already there. His life is the Lord Jesus, is his life. He's in union with Christ. It's just that he's out of this world now and he's, he's, he's uh, experiences his life in glory. So that's a great comfort for a Christian to realize that he's not going to experience death, that he's he's not going to have to go through death twice. He's already gone through it in the Lord Jesus Christ, back at Calvary. That's quite a quite a bonus for us that we didn't realize we had. And as we get older that'll become quite valuable, quite a comfort. If you were as old as I am you'd uh, appreciate that more. <laughs> All right, now, also in um, Colossians 3, since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, for ye died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What a wonderful truth. I remember, uh, oh, it was quite a number of years ago. It was during a, one of our early morning prayer meetings at uh, one of the Wheaton churches where I was an elder. And we would meet at 6.30, I think it was, in the morning, the board, the pastor, and we had wonderful times of prayer every Lord's Day morning. And then we'd drive back home, have breakfast, Get our wives, 
children, whatever it might be, and come to church. And it was an Easter morning, I remember. And I was thinking, as the men were praying and we were waiting for our turn and all, I was thinking about the fact that Easter had risen, and we were risen, uh, alive in the Lord Jesus. And the Lord seemed to give me this thought of uh, keep looking down, because uh, our position and our citizenship is in glory in the Lord Jesus, and we're above as the source of our life, and we're to be seated in heavenly places in our attitude as well as the fact that we're there positionally. And it makes a great difference to realize where we are, that we can uh, abide in the Lord Jesus and see that He, that we're above circumstances and we're above so-called problems and all. We can look at them from that viewpoint. We don't have to feel that we're down underneath everything and everything bearing down upon us and we're uh, seeking to register our cry and our plea to heaven to get God to hear us and um, to get some help about this situation or that situation. No, he's placed us in his son who is, vic uh, who is victor over all. And uh, we can uh, look at things from above, not be pressed down by them. That attitude and that realization makes a great difference when a person is taken through something. So I had this card printed up. I still have some copies that says, Keep Looking Down. And it's been interesting as I have shared these cards with different ones, pastors and Christians, and it's very seldom that uh, the individual realizes what's being said there, and <clears throat> their reaction right away is, oh, you've got this twisted around. We're supposed to keep looking up. And I've received a, a number of very interesting letters from pastors and different ones how uh, I missed the point completely. Well, what does that show one? It doesn't that clearly reveal that uh, it certainly isn't the individual's thinking. He doesn't realize his position in his everyday walk. It's not his attitude. And, of course, uh, that's why we're being shown these truths from the Word, why the Holy Spirit deals with us, to show us the truth so that we can see what we have in the Lord Jesus and where we are. And what a difference that makes in our everyday life. What a difference that makes in our praying. What a difference that makes in our uh, faith when we see where we are raised up together made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus since ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God for ye died and your life is hid with Christ in God these are wonderful truths these are positional truths these truths belong to the Christian these are facts about him And then we come to Romans 6.6. 6. Now, knowing this, Paul wants us to know this, that our old man, our old nature, the nature we received from Adam, was crucified with the Lord Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed or annulled. It doesn't mean uh, destroyed. The Greek there is not actually destroyed. It's annulled, put out of commission. That the body of sin might be annulled, that henceforth we should not serve sin, that we should not have to serve sin. That the annulment comes when we count upon the fact of our death in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit applies that finished work of death upon the old life, and he holds it in the place of death as we count upon the facts, as we walk by faith in these facts. Knowing this, and of course when we know it, we reckon, we reckon upon it spontaneously, effortlessly. And knowing this, that our old nature was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed or annulled, that henceforth we should not have to serve sin, not have to be in slavery to it. And, of course, this destroyed uh, is the same Greek word is in different areas in the New Testament. And it means uh, annulled or put out of work or out of business or to render ineffective. And Paul used this word 26 times in different places in Romans. To make without effect, to make void, to make of none effect, loosed, delivered, 
And as we think, of course, where the word says in uh, Hebrews 2.14 that uh, at Calvary that Satan was destroyed. Well, we know he wasn't destroyed. He wasn't put out of existence or anything. But his power was broken. And as we count ourselves dead indeed unto sin and out of his realm and all, uh, his power upon the Christian is annulled. He cannot hold him uh, as a slave. He's rendered ineffective as the Christian walks by faith in these facts, as he reckons upon the truth. Reckoning doesn't do it. The truth is what carries this out. Reckoning simply is the key to it. And the wonderful thing about this first half of Romans 6 is that what Paul is doing here, he's showing us the facts about first about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then he shows the Christian that he's in the Lord Jesus Christ and was in the Lord Jesus Christ when all this happened. So that as we find out what happened to the Lord Jesus, we know what happened to us. And that's the way he's laid this first part of this chapter out. He gives us the facts about the Lord Jesus. And when the facts are all laid forth, and we finally get to Romans 6, 11, and he says, uh, since this happened to the Lord Jesus, and since you were identified with him, then likewise count ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ our Lord. Because that is the position of the Lord Jesus. He's dead to sin, and he's alive in God. And where he is, the Christian is. And we think of Romans 6, 7. For he that hath died is freed from sin. And of course he's speaking of the Lord Jesus who died out of the realm of sin, died unto sin. And he's freed from the domination of sin. Freed from the power of sin. And then Romans 6, 8. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And of course, the it isn't if, if there's no question there about if, it's since we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And then Romans 6, 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So he's showing us what happened to the Lord Jesus. And then he's, of course, revealing the fact that the Christian was in the Lord Jesus at that time, identified with him. So that what happened to Christ happened to the Christian. Uh, Romans 6.10 For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And see how Romans 6.11 fits into that. First uh, 6.10 For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise count ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, for he died unto sin. Count yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God, but count yourselves alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, in order to see what is ours, we first see what happened to the Lord Jesus. Then we know what happened to us. That is true identification. And Paul has very carefully laid out here in these verses what happened to the Lord Jesus. And then he shows us that that happened to each Christian in God's reckoning, in God's eyes, God's economy. And he asks us this key verse, 611, he says, Also, likewise, uh, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ. And that, that we're dead unto sin. It doesn't say that sin is dead. Sin is very much alive, both in the Christian and around the Christian. It says to be count himself, himself to be dead unto sin, out of the realm of. Sin is not dead, but we're dead to it. Death separates us from it. We're alive in the Lord Jesus Christ now, and he's living in God. So that uh, the death that we experienced in him now separates us from the domination and the influence and the slavery of sin. 
we must see this picture clearly dead unto it and alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord very important distinction because if we wonder why sin isn't dead if we try to reckon sin dead it'll only make it all the more alive no it's uh, it's seeing that gap of death that we pass through is now separating us from the old and that we're alive in the new that's the picture to see our death in the Lord Jesus at Calvary buried with him and then risen anew in newness of life new creations in Christ Jesus born anew brand new life his life we were identified with him he became our very life and now death separates us from the old the death that we rose out of not the death that we're in we're not dead now we're very much alive with eternal life life that will never die Christ who is our life and there's this a thought here the question comes um, what is the secret of reckoning and uh, it is revelation knowing Paul says know ye not and knowing this we need the revelation from God himself and of course uh, that's uh, there's the grace of God to give us that sight and it comes through our conditioning through all that he puts it, the things that he puts us through the failure and all where we're ready to see then the Holy Spirit is able to open up these truths to us and not until we're conditioned. There's no rushing ahead and in getting into these truths. Have, we have to be brought to them by the Holy Spirit. So that's the secret of reckoning. It's revelation. To know. And of course, we only really know truth as it's given to us by the Spirit of truth. And we have to study just as though, just as hard, and just as definitely, and just as purposefully, and explicitly as though the whole thing were up to us. There's no, just because the Holy Spirit is revealing truth to us doesn't mean that we don't have to study. Never. Because he does, he reveals the truth to us through our prayerful, dependent study. Paul told Timothy to study. And the Christian who is not a really a, a good student, he's going to have a lot of trouble really getting anywhere if he's not a student of the Word. There's no slipshod uh, rushing over things. One must settle down and study. Independence upon the Holy Spirit because he reveals the truth of the Word through our minds as we study it. And this is uh, geared with the things that he takes us through in our everyday life to uh, prepare us to create needs in our lives which drives us to study for instance in certain areas that things become relevant to us and we become interested in this and that through our need and we, the whole thing opens up to us just because for instance something we're going through during the day during that time and that's the way he works to prepare us to open up these truths to us hard study and allowing him to take us through things day by day. That is the prepared heart. We need the revelation from God himself. We need to have our eyes open to the fact of our union with Christ. Most of us can remember the day when we saw clearly that Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And now what he wants us to see is the fact that we and Christ died not only for sin but he died unto sin he died out of the realm of sin and of course the Christian died out of the realm of sin in him most of us can remember the day when we saw clearly that Christ died for us and we ought to be equally clear as to the time when we saw that we died with Christ for us substitution with Christ identification substitution birth truths, identification, growth truths. My dear friend, how many times have you heard that? Christians don't hear that simple, all-important fact, distinction. Justification is for birth, identification is for growth. It is not that I reckon myself dead, and therefore I will be dead. It is that because I did die, because I see now that God 
what God did with me in Christ on the cross, therefore I count myself to have died. It is not reckoning toward death, but from death. And there we must see our position. We must see the finished work and stand upon those facts. We count from what happened and not try to count toward something that will happen. The Christian's life is already complete in the Lord Jesus. Ye are complete in Him. And we draw from that finished source, not only for death to the old, but for our life in the new. Believers are seen by God as risen ones, dead unto sin, with Christ risen. How shall we any longer be living in sin, if indeed we died to it? And this perplexes many, this announcement that we died to sin. Inasmuch as the struggle with sin... And that is one of the most constant conscious experiences of the undeliver, undelivered believer. And that's the thing. that That's why it's so hard for a Christian to reckon too, because he's so aware of sin in his life. The struggle and the failure of Romans 7 is what has brought him to these truths. And he's, he, the main thing that he's aware of is his failure and his sin and himself. And that's why it's hard for him to count the fact that he's dead to sin because he's so very much he feels so very much alive to it. And that's why the Christian must be really prepared before he'll ever really enter into these truths because all of his feelings and all of his consciousness is dead set against it. So he has to be very sure of his facts. But we must not confound our relationship to sin with its presence and our relationship to sin is that we're dead unto it. Our experience, our daily experience with sin is that we're alive unto it, but we are not to go by experience. We're go, we first go by our relationship. We first go by our position. And the facts, the, tr the faith in those facts will progressively affect our condition and our experience. The facts must come first. The faith must come first. And that will have effect upon the experience, the daily growth. It's not experience first. It is faith and facts come first. And true experience springs from that which is already true of us, springs from a finished work that we're complete in the Lord Jesus. We first must distinguish this revealed fact that we died from our experience of deliverance. We first get the facts, and we distinguish the facts from our experience, because the struggling Christian, his experience is that he's not delivered. But the facts of the word are, is that he is delivered. You see how we have to walk by faith. And as we have faith in the finished work, the finished work applied by the Holy Spirit will progressively deliver us in our experience. For we did not die to sin by our experiences. Our experiences when we're failing is that we're very much alive to sin. We died to sin in Christ's death. This is a scriptural fact. The presence of sin in our members will make this fact that we died to it hard to grasp and hold. But God says it, and he will explain to our faith in time as we stand upon the facts. Stand therefore, and reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. God says it because it's true, and we're to stand upon what God says, not but what we feel. Do you believe that you died to sin? Do you feel dead? Does it seem like presumption for you to say that you died to sin? Why? Because you say, I am conscious of the workings and activity of sin within me. We must. I know I say and do things that are sinful. In all this, we are speaking of our feelings and experiences, are we not? We must turn our eyes and faith upon spiritual facts, the truth. And as we reckon and count and stand, as this becomes our attitude, well, Lord, I see that and I know it now, the Holy Spirit will minister within the facts of the finished work and begin to make it actual in our daily work. Not I, but Christ. 
And He, the Holy Spirit, ministers according to the truth. He ministers according to the Christian's faith. The Christian has to walk and to live and to stand by faith in the facts. That is what the Holy Spirit honors, the truth. And that is what He, he will use. And one needn't be discouraged that this seems complicated and difficult because it will all be made clear as one waits upon the Lord and as one studies and as one allows the Lord to deal with him. And you, the Christian will finally come to see that these identification truths are just as simple as substitution. And they had to be simple because even the sinner, at the moment he's saved, at that time, way back then, in his uh, lost condition, he's able to see that, that the Lord Jesus was his substitute. And this is exactly the same thing. If in its work, something that happened at Calvary, simply because the Word says it, and the Word is saying that which happened, it is setting forth that which happened. And it's very simple. As one is willing to wait upon the Lord and look to Him and depend upon Him, while one studies and while one is being conditioned in the everyday life by the Holy Spirit, these truths will become just A, B, C simple. And uh, the Christian will be more sure of them than he's sure of anything. But it takes time, dear friends. It takes years. So we must give God a chance to bring us along. And not try to rush ahead. Not try to push God. I often think of the illustration of uh, we can't push God. We can't demand. He's sovereign and He's out for our good. We don't have to demand anything. Simply wait upon Him uh, in expectation. The, uh, the right attitude, not pushing against God, but yes, leaning on God, leaning, just kind of lean against Him and uh, lean against him, uh, waiting upon him, that, that eager and yet patient and restful uh, longing. You think of your little dog at the back door. He wants to come in. And my, he's just, he's just leaning against that door. And you open that door and he just bursts right in. He's right there ready. And he's uh, reaching out. He knows he can't push the door down, but you open the door and he's he's in. And that's that's the attitude of faith of waiting upon God, an expectation, a leaning toward, a leaning against, and he'll he'll open the things up. Our Father, wilt thou keep in our minds the fact that thou art our Father, that thou art the sovereign God that God is God and that thou art out for our good and thou hast completed all of thy plan for us in the Lord Jesus and thou wilt give it to us as we look to thee and rest in thee and depend upon thee and as we grow we thank thee for this in the name of the Lord Jesus Amen